So how have you both been? It is a wonky school year, my friend. <laughs> so Diane, tell me about the new job. How's it going? Actually, I'm loving it. Um, I am now the coordinator of digital literacy for the Wichita Public Schools. So I support around 47,000 students and around 4,700 teachers. So yeah, it's, it's big and it's awesome. And we are, we're doing the best to make a lot of magic even in the midst of everything. Well, being that your chapter was on professional learning and development, and you are now in charge of training all of those teachers during a pandemic, I am sure that there's going to be some questions that I'm going to ask about that coming up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so Trista, how have you been? I'm well, thanks. Yeah, yes. it, it is a wacky time, isn't it? Yeah. It totally is. And si <laughs> since we chatted last week, I ordered uh, two of Joel Westheimer books, and, uh, and that's my weekend reading. So I'm going to dive into some, uh, some education and democracy from, from Joel this weekend. That's great. That's good to hear. You know, I was thinking about this that um, Diane, you and I have never met in person. No. Nope. Um, and so this, uh, we're talking about professional development and learning with teachers. And I'm like, this is, it's also about collaborating with people in different spaces. So thanks to you, Mike, for getting us in to connection and learning from one another. And it's amazing. I feel like, oh, it's so nice to be able to chat again. <laughs> yes. He's up to you. So, yeah. Thanks. When we were writing all of that pre COVID. Yeah. And then, whoosh, so quickly, things yeah. change. And, and I would say, Trista, that we should totally get together in New Zealand for ICSI, but um, I guess we're going to have to wait one more year. I, and, and, and I'm not sure if it's been announced where it is next year, but wherever it is, that, that's the place where we'll have to get together. Yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. Um, just that whole idea of travel is such a, an interesting concept and one that, uh, you know, I don't see happening anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. So, um, so for those of you that are, uh, that are joining us a little bit late, I am talking with Diane Smokorowski and Dr. Trista Holwick about their chapter in Flip the System U.S., How Teachers Can Transform Education and Save Democracy. Uh, and their chapter is in the section on supporting teachers, and it focuses on professional learning and development, um, which is, as we know, just incredibly important, probably more than ever, um, in the past eight months since the pandemic hit. Uh, but before we dive into all of that, do both of you want to comment and kind of define that term? Because, because I love what you've done in the chapter is you've taken, um, you know, so often there's this discussion about whether it's professional learning and professional development, um, what the term means. And you just said, okay, we're going to jam those two things together and make it one term. So talk about your thought process there and, and why you've put those two things together. Do you want me to go ahead with that, Dan? Sure, just yeah. So yeah, we we had that discussion, and you see it so much in the literature. You know, is it professional learning? Is it professional development? And they're used interchangeably everywhere. And um, so for us, we really thought, yeah, that when we looked at Fullen and Hargrave's work, who looked at professional learning and professional development and both being intertwined, that was something that worked for us. So using both the terms, then you can have professional learning opportunities leading to professional development. You know, so there should be no professional learning without development. Mm -hmm. And usually professional development also uh, contributes to the professional learning. So just using both terms and looking at it. And again, terminology is so important. I think that's what we found when we were writing the chapter. So we, we put a whole section in trying to like figure out what are the terms that we're using why do we use these terms? Why is it important? Um, and I think that's a lot when it comes to professional learning and development with teachers is what's the common terminology? What's our common purpose? Why are we doing what we're doing? And do we all understand and, and agree? And, and I think that's a great first step. I don't know, do you wanna add anything to that, Diane? I think you summed it up. And I would say that we did, you know, we really did kind of wrestle with that. And, you know, Trisha would just went back to the literature more than once was like, okay, I really think yeah. this is what we, we kind of listed our philosophies and what we've done with teachers and explained that first. And then she matched that to the literature together and said, this is what we're doing. Like, that's exactly what we're doing. So that's the direction <laughs> we're going. And you took it one step further. And instead of just, uh, talking about professional learning and development, you talked about, uh, this lofty ideal that we should aspire for, which is transformational professional learning and development. Um, talk about what that modifier adds to the term and why we should aspire for transformation. So Diane, I'll let you, I'll let you start with that. You know, actually I'm going to have Trista because she did a lot of research on this, but I don't want to mess up the jargon okay. again. So I'll let her kickstart it and then yeah. I'll, I'll tag it. 
<laughs> well, I think that's the beauty. Like we're, it's all the conversation, right? And so these were the conversations that we were having. Um, and what does it mean for something to be transformational? And so what are, what's our goal? And we really did, like Diane just said, dig into what have, what have we been doing? What's our philosophy? Why are we doing this work? What's our hope for it? What do we feel that the teachers hope? Because it really is about teacher led um, opportunities and for teachers by teachers. So, and what does transformation, what is our end game? We want education to be the space of change for, for kids, for families, for communities, for teachers, for leaders, you know, so that it is a lofty goal and one I think I'm gonna constantly cling to. You know, I, I think we live in this place and dwell in a place of hope for something better and change. And I think now more than ever, the pandemic, we hear it all the time, but it's, we have an opportunity to start rethinking like what, what is working, what isn't working and do it better. And for the staff, for the students, you know, in our communities. And, and so for us, it is around, I think, transformational, like not only it's how, what we do, what we believe, how we are so it is it is a lofty lofty term lofty goals and that's i'm gonna stick by that <laughs> yeah and, and diane but diane before you jump in I, I will just say that the examples that you give um from personal experience both of you in the chapter show that what you've done is exactly that that, that you have in some ways met that lofty ideal of of creating transformation in the spaces where you've been working with teachers. Um, and so I, I don't, I, while I think it's lofty and I think we all agree on that, <laughs> it's not unattainable. And you give some concrete ways in the chapter that it can be attained. Um, so Dan, I'll let, I'll let you add a little bit there though. So one of the key pieces that we both came to conclusion as we were sharing our stories was how teacher leadership played a role in both of these places. That it took the idea of teachers wanting to become leaders and maybe not wanting, I would say owning is a better word to say that. Um, it's a very courageous thing to do, to say that I, I am becoming a different teacher and that it's okay to own that. And it's okay to share my story, take it forward and inspire the next drop in that, uh, if we're going lofty, we're like playing a virtual candy, candy land game yet, right? So eventually we're going to get to the purple forest on the other end, <laughs> but it is carrying that step forward with people alongside. So you're not an entity out there. You are a collaborative piece. And, you know, Mike, you and I both know Alicia Moss, and I'm going to give a shout out to her real quickly. She is one teacher that I have walked through this journey for 12 years and started when she was a first year teacher and my son was in her classroom. And when you met her a few years ago, you could see that she was starting to own her leadership. And this past year, she took on professional or she took on project-based learning and really, really dove into it the way it was supposed to be, led other teachers through the process. And as she was telling the story of what her students experienced, and it went to the heart of why they, why they want to learn. You speak on this all the time, Mike, that there's a relevance when there's an emotional piece to it. And tears started streaming down her face. And I said, you, you know, did you see what happened? You now understand what personal connections to learning looks like and feels like. And my friend, you've crossed that bridge in education. There is no going back. It is a one-way trip. Yeah. And all you can do is go forward and carry someone with you. So my candy land analogy was a little, you know, off topic a bit, <laughs> but the idea is that she's continuing and transforming not only herself, but others with her. And I, I just want to pick up on what you just said there, Diane, too, that for both of us, it's the expertise that's in the building. We really believe that, that it, it, it doesn't have to be outside. And so we called it, right, pockets of innovation that they're everywhere, we just don't hear about them. So um, how do you have these pockets and how do you accompany others? How do you help others grow and, uh, and move forward? So I think, yeah, that's a beautiful story about Alicia. Yeah, and, and um, I, I wanna comment on, both, on what both of you said there for a second, but uh, just I'll, I'll start with you. Um, so you and I met each other in Morocco face-to-face -face for the first time back in, uh, in January. Um, and that's where we started having these conversations. But speaking to your point of these pockets of innovation, one of the things that immediately struck me about you uh, and the group that we were with, kind of our mutual friends that we were with in Morocco, is the, the value that uh, 
the culture of, of valuing leadership that will, or, um, um, and, and networking that was within that group, right? Um, there was this constant willingness and desire to share and to bring other people along. And even the term pracademic that was that was used so much in, in that space, um, people who were both practitioners, but also um, doing research and, um, and in these spaces where they were pushing the profession forward was valued so much. And, and it was just we, we, like, everyone wanted to share their expertise with others and bring everyone along. And I think when you have spaces where teachers in the building are encouraged to share their leadership with others, but are also at the same time developing networks outside of their building so that they can learn from others. It creates this incredibly powerful dynamic where um, growth and, and development is accelerated within that space. Um, and, and that's where kind of, I want to go back to you, Diane, and, and give you a chance to talk about this a little bit. Um, you and I have known each other for uh, what, like well over a decade now, right? And have been doing work together. Um, and we've, we've seen this dynamic where um, true leaders create other leaders, right? Um, and, and I think you and I, as, as people who have been um, put into places where we have leadership capacity and, and the ability to have a platform, have really owned that and tried to bring other people along in that way. And I think you just gave a, a great example. Um, but we've also been in that space of developing a professional learning network for years. Um, and one of the things that you do extremely well is you connect people to others outside that, that you know from other spaces so that when they develop that leadership capacity, they're constantly learning not just from you, but from other people. And I want you to speak about um, how you came to see that as important um, and how you do that when you're training other teachers, how you're exposing them to others and, and helping them build their, um, their view of education outside just the Wichita area. Okay. so. You and I both know, we, we, and our audience will be like, all right, you guys have all these inside conversations, but a very, very short summary of our partnership in, in leadership several years now is that we discovered way back when that there are three questions you ask yourself every time you design a lesson. What experiences do I want my students to have? And my students may have mortgages. That's the only difference between a learner in kindergarten and an adult learner. They still need those real world connections and the emotional piece. So what, what experiences do I want them to have? Two, what do I need to assess? What is it that I want to know that they know on the other end? And three, who do they need to talk to? And when you and I started with this idea of, of connecting through virtual connections in our classrooms, we started to find if we're studying plants or we're studying, you know, it could be on the civil rights movement or it could be something in a CTE class on glass blowing and we're doing an art piece. There is someone out there that is passionate about that work. So when I started doing that with my students, it was quickly, I was addicted to this. And any time that I could bring in those real world connections with others, just happens all the time. And it's kind of like, like a bigger scale now. I'll tell you later what I'm doing. But <laughs> <laughs> um, when we started leading in professional learning, I knew that the more smart, passionate, innovative, and divergent thinkers that I could surround myself with, my own thinking was challenged, pushed forward, required me to be more reflective. And then it was okay, there is something amazing about this, what this other school is doing, what this teacher's philosophy is, how do I align that with what I wanna see happen in the classroom? So when I start running professional learning pieces, I look at the index of the super friends that we've made over the years as we start another podcast or had another conversation, attended a conference event and said, oh, you're, you're kind of awesome. You're doing this incredible work on the equity conversation would you be willing to talk to my teachers? And instantly those connections are forged. And again, the same thing that happened to me, surrounding yourself by really smart, passionate people who are doing innovative things, that is contagious to pass forward. So not only do we do that in professional learning experiences, and if we wanna call it professional learning that leads to professional transformative development, then we've transformed our teachers on the other end who then yeah. go back to their classroom and talk to the teacher next door, talk to another teacher in another community and the ripples continue. Krista, along those lines, um, I know that um, 
collaborative professionalism is something that you believe in strongly. You write about it in the chapter uh, and you lean on some of the research from, uh, from Carol Campbell uh, in the chapter. Do you wanna talk about how that kind of intersects with what Diane was just talking about? Well, that idea of, I, I was thinking about the ripples um, and, and how her networking is maybe at a larger scale. And I think a little bit more within schools, you know, from teachers who are early career coming in, but having that network being built immediately when you come in and seeing amazing teaching and what that does to inspire you because you're going to be the next mentor and the next coach uh, leader. And so like building that within schools and then across a district. So I think we, we do similar work and our and networking is so important. And for me, the key in collaborative professionalism is this idea of um, that it's the solidarity and the solidity. So it's not just the relationships because those are those are really important, obviously, as supportive structures, but it's really that expertise piece and celebrating teachers for their expertise. Mm. Um, and, and having that space to say, you know, I am really good at this. <laughs> Um, and, it, and, and I'm learning, it doesn't mean, you know, but I have expertise and I, it's something I can share with someone and together we can grow and, and do more. And so to me, that idea of collaborative professionalism is, is that marrying of the two. So not just a, a good relationship, but that it's a relationship that holds one to account, challenges, you know, and supports. And if we're really talking transformational learning, it's sometimes challenging some of our own thinking. And where we get a little bit uh, set in our ways. And so having that person that you trust because they, it's a space of support that they will ask you questions to push you further. And, and to me, that's the ripples too. Like how powerful is that when it's across schools and, and whole districts, like you're talking in the major scale, you know, mine's a much more a small, but like also I want to retain teachers. So that's like an ultimate goal is retain teachers that are well, um, teachers that are, are committed, that are enjoying and find that they still have leadership opportunities. So I think Diane and I were really always talking about the opportunity for leadership because not everyone wants to go into administration. Not everybody wants to um, do something else. So where is that space that you can continue to grow and continue to be inspired? And so that really, that for me is, is the key to collaborative professionalism too. Yeah, as, as someone who's had their master's degree in educational administration and a principal certificate for 12 years um, and has no desire to use it, I can attest to that. <laughs> Not everybody wants to go into an administrative role. Um, but, but speaking of administration, one of the questions that I had kind of jotted down as I went through your chapter um, and read it again for the 93rd time or whatever it's been since, <laughs> since you first gave it to me and I've edited it and looked it over, um, was the role of uh, not teacher leaders but of district leaders and administration in creating the kind of culture that allows this to happen. Um, because in oppressive or top-down or really uh, strict hierarchical structures within districts, I could see how this would be really difficult. Um, and so obviously teachers have a challenge if that's the, if that's the case, but if you were speak, speaking to administration uh, right now and, and making the case that this is what you should foster in your building, um, what would you say to them? I would start with, it takes the administrator support in order to help that teacher move to the full transformational level. So when a teacher wants to take academic risk for them, if they are willing to try something with project-based learning, if they're willing to have harder conversations around history, if they're willing to try something a little bit more out of the box, they need that support in the building to say, that's what you're here for. We're, we're here to make real world connections to kids. That is that is key in that transformational process. Trista? Yeah, and I'm thinking purely resource and structure level. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have a lot of initiatives that happen at the grassroots level, but ultimately, and, and being someone whose master's was on another program that was really amazing and implemented and the way, when I got the data back, it was, like changing, life changing for teachers. And the, the day I handed in my master's, uh, it was no longer a program offered in our district. The, the money dried up. Mm. So, you know, you, you even though things are really powerful and amazing, you do need advocates who <laughs> manage the budget, who yeah. can advocate for what you're doing, who can provide the structure, um, who can help you with the coherence across different initiatives. I mean, initiative fatigue is real. Mm. 
Um, and so, you know, like, so I'm, I'm thinking about that from the administrative district level, you need advocates and you need someone really who's able to see the big picture as well and, and fight for what you're doing. And that is a big worry for me in the pandemic um, that, that resources are gonna be so tight. Uh, but I think if we can't afford not to be focusing on our staff and what we know works and how to support them. And again, it, it has to be by choice. I think that was something that came out for both yeah. of us. It, it, not mandated for all, but offered. Um, and sometimes it takes different people longer to join in. They need to see it working before they're interested. Um, and But so building and taking time and being okay with things taking time is so important. So that's why you need those, those people who are gonna be able to be committed for a long time um maybe collecting data around it helps right for that mm -hmm. yeah so we, we only have about 10 minutes left and i want to make sure that we leave those who are watching with like concrete examples which you do a great job of, of giving in the book um but i'm going to ask you to uh share your examples with a little bit of a twist um so obviously the examples that you shared are things that you've done in the past that have worked really well um but all of them are pre-covid and so what I'm going to ask is to share your examples, um, and I'll, I'll cue you up, um, but then also talk about how this might look in the COVID era if you were trying to pull off something similar. Okay, um, so Diane, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you start with your teacher leader cohorts that you've done in the past. Okay. Yeah. So, um, in that one, those were a two-year experience because we discovered pretty quickly that to really hit the transformational level, it takes introduction of elements, chew on them, reflect, come back, add another piece, come back and think through those things. And usually after one year, we found that we could help teachers understand mechanics of what we're trying to accomplish and help them kind of think through it. It's that application where it hits and resonates happens in that second year. And it's almost like the light bulb hits off about, you know, second year, about three quarters of the year in, they're like, oh, that's what you've been talking about all this time, right? And the way we set that up is that those teachers would come to me once a month. We had cohorts of teachers that we provided technology training, um, teacher leadership training, and looking at what innovation, innovative schools were doing. So it was also just helping them kind of like, I'm gonna drop a few seeds, what, what sings to your heart, right? With that, in a COVID experience, I still can do this. I'm just going to be a little bit more intentional that there are opportunities where we can do this Zoom kind of experience in the dialogue that's completely possible, but I still can also dial in Mike or Trista to come and talk to my teachers. Tell your story. What is it that, that you're interested in? Oh, you've got students there who want to talk about what you're doing in class today. Can we just observe for a little bit? Can we just dial in? And even though I'm in Kansas, can I see what's happening in Canada today? That's definitely an element. And the third one is that we are building more, I don't even think, it's not even powerful is the best word, but I would say they're, they're forging relationships with our community outreach elements, zoos, museums, nature centers, all of these places can't have field trips. So I'm going to them and they're coming to me and saying, how can we build real world amazing things happening for teachers and students in this environment? Well, we can go with teachers to the nature center, but this is how it shifts. We may not all be in the same place, but we're all on the same virtual call. They can get in their car join the call, have a conversation. And then the nature center person says, all right, this is your application time. I would like for you to go out into the nature preserve or go out into the zoo. I'm gonna give you three or four things to really think about in science. And you're gonna think about how we can do this in our science classroom at the same time. You go out there, I'm gonna give you 25 minutes. Here's some things to think about. Okay. And Siri wants to play. And then we come back in and jump on the call like, okay, where are you? What are you noticing? It's those same conversations we would do side by side and just spreading us out a little bit further and immersing us in the space to do that work. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the last book that I put together, the teaching in the fourth industrial revolution was um, the case that I made in my first chapter was that our use of technology in schools has to be, um, 
uh, rooted in the things that are most important in school, relationships, empathy, humanity, compassion. Um, and I love what you're talking about there, Diane, is a use of technology that isn't to deliver content, but is to build those relationships and, um, and strengthen a pedagogical model, which allows some of the things to happen that should be happening in classrooms anyway. So I, 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 love, I love that example. Uh, Trista, dive into your uh, coaching and mentoring fellowship a little bit and what that might like, look like if a district was trying to pull that off during, uh, you know, during the pandemic. During the pandemic. Um, so the, what I was talking about was a, a component of their teacher induction program, which began about 10 years ago uh, in Western Quebec School Board. So small school board, but very large uh, district. And all, all it is, it's not like novel. We, every person who comes to the district, regardless of your um, years of previous teaching, you're paired with a administrator selected mentor coach. Um, and I think what, what maybe is a bit different is how we define mentoring and coaching and that it, they're two distinct uh, processes and approaches uh, and that we provide support for the mentor coaches as well as looking at it as an opportunity for leadership. And so every teacher works at schools, goes through a coaching cycle um, and is supported in that first year. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that you're not also supported by the other people in your school building. Hopefully it's a culture of, of support. And as I'm thinking about this uh, in your question, I think now we really, this is needed more than ever. And I know, you know, so when I was involved in it, it was 2008 to 2017. And I have some amazing colleagues that have taken it over and bringing their own uh, slice of, of uh, like and little spicy components to it and, and making it grow and making it better, which again, is I think a sign of teacher leadership that, you know, it changes and it's always based on, on feedback. And so for, for me, it's, it's, it's in place. Um, and we have more new teachers than ever. And we have really a problem with the uh, teacher retention currently. Um, just the, and so having this opportunity for mentor coaches, so experienced teachers to be paired with people coming in and having a chance to connect that structured and valued, supported, I think would be so valuable. And also having a chance to think about what does this look like in a hybrid, blended, um, online, virtual, face-to-face -face context, depending. Uh, you know, just having that person that's there to support um, and a reciprocal relationship. So yeah, things are going to change in terms of the structure, but I think at the core of um, focusing on on the students and the student learning that it, and having those important conversations about growth, our own growth and that of our students um, will remain. Uh, and almost, you know, I'm grateful it's there for anyone who's coming in right now that they have that support. So. You made a really powerful point in there that I think ties to the central theme of Flip the System uh, in a really important way. Uh, and of course, the entire book, all 22 chapters in the epilogue are all focused on how the American education system specifically, but there's applications outside the United States, um, how we can uh, restore is not the right word, but how, how we can place public education uh, as the foundation of a healthy democracy, uh, which is needed right now. Uh, and that can't be done if we're hemorrhaging teachers. And, and one of the things that's so important about your chapter is it shows concrete ways that we can support teachers so that we can keep them in the profession and develop them to be their best professional selves, um, which, is, which is so important and what we need. Um, but at the end of your chapter, so, so as when I read your chapter the first time, I, I've, I've never told either one of you this, but as I read it, I was, went through and it was, I, I mean, you know, I know both of you and I, Trist, I had read your research. I've known Diane for years. And um, so it was pretty much what I expected and it was great. And I was really, okay, this is fantastic. And then I got to the end and it was like, oh, wow, they went there, right? You know, and there was this piece where you talked about not only do teachers need um, autonomy and agency in, in the teaching and learning process, but then you got into like, okay, and you've got to back it up with resources. Um, so talk a little bit yeah. about that because that is critical. And, and I love that you went there in your chapter. Uh, I, I mean, I think you said it, you need resources, <laughs> yeah. you know, and we need to prioritize. It can't be just done on the backs. You know, you see this right now. Um, teachers are, are stepping up and doing amazing things. And a lot of it is happening um, 
and being unsung uh, and it's because it's the right thing to do for the students in front of them and from a place of care but people are going to burn out um, they need resources they need support they need um, someone to check in but also you know we need to be thinking about that at the policy level we need to be thinking out of the system level we can't keep putting more things in place we need to figure out what can we take away during this time to help teachers do the really important work of connecting with students and supporting them and bringing them through this year because this is this is unlike any other year but we have a generation right that we want covid to be a, a place that we think back to like it was a very odd time but it wasn't damaging for a long time and i think we've already known that schools did not serve so many students so now we need to really be thinking about how do we do this better so yeah resources I, I resources and, and Diane, but before you answer, I'm, I'm going to add one little element here and then actually ask you to comment. So I know that uh, you and I have both been organizers of ed camps uh, forever. Yeah. And, and that's one of the spaces where we um, try and empower teachers to take control of their own uh, professional learning and development. Um, but when it comes to resources, one of the cases that you make in the chapter is that not only are resources necessary, but teacher leaders and those who are doing the work should have control over how those resources are allocated in order to, to uh, allow this to happen in schools. And mm -hmm. so I want you to draw on your ed camp experience and talk about uh, the necessity for teachers to be controlling um, some of the money that's used for these purposes. So if you really want to see the transformational piece occur, then the professional development and professional learning has to be personalized. And if we give the opportunity for teachers to say, I'd like you to dream up, what is it first, what is it you know you need? How are you going to make that happen? And if you need to have a conversation around um, podcasting. I'm just going with the tech thing, so to speak. How are you gonna do that if you don't have the equipment, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or what if you could visit a radio station to actually listen to people who do this for a living and actually take a tour and dialogue? It takes money to get to those places. But if the teachers can say, I, this is the plan that we're building. This is the outcomes we're trying to achieve this is how it's going to impact our classroom. First off, they're going to find out that there's really great ways to do this creatively, that once they have that experience, they should always save some of their resources to say, all right, now I need to apply this in my classroom. I took the funding that I needed to, to go travel, or I needed to uh, buy equipment, but then hold some, because after you are exposed to what's out there, you read a book, whatever it is, you need elements to purchase to make that a reality. So you might discover you need a subscription or you might need to, um, you know, invest in a, in a ring light, you know, whatever it is that you need to, to do some sort of a vodcast. Mm -hmm. If we don't allow teachers to design that themselves, then A, they're gonna feel like it's still a top-down approach that you really don't trust me and how I can grow. And secondly, we are going to squelch that innovation where they would take it to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. And if we believe children need to have those real world, passionate, you know, just powerful experiences, if the teacher's got a huge passion for it, that's gonna transform even more effectively. So the teachers need to own that experience. Wow, this was- Can I comment? Yeah, of Just course, go ahead, Yeah, no, go for it. Yeah. I mean, I think what you said, Diane, is so important and it, it boils down to trust. Do we trust the teachers? And if we trust the teachers, then how do we show it? And that's by you know, providing them with these resources and letting them go, because I think we'll reap the benefits. Mm -hmm. you know, but you have to trust that, trust the process. And that's, that's the hardest part. Yeah. And uh, thank you both for taking some time to have this amazing conversation. Uh, thank you for your incredible chapter. Uh, but one of the things that, you know, in addition to having other people read your work and, um, and be exposed to it and have their schools and their practice transformed, one of the things that's most excited for me is seeing the two of you put together um, and, and your passions and how it intersects so nicely <laughs> and, your, and your different perspectives and how it comes together. So I, I think this is just the start of an awesome relationship that is going to be fruitful, not just both for the both of you, uh, but for also uh, so many other teachers who are going to benefit from the two of you being together. Uh, so thank you for everything you've done over the past couple of months. Well, thanks for making that happen, Mike. That's that's because of you. So <laughs> appreciate it. This was a, this was a magical pairing. Absolutely. <laughs>